Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. More than a million additional doses of a COVID-19 vaccine could be arriving in Canada by the end of next month. School boards across Alberta will be receiving more federal funding to help with various needs during the pandemic. And sad news for hockey fans in our province, minor hockey will not be returning for league games this winter as Hockey Alberta canceled the remainder of the season. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. Canada could receive up to 1.1 million additional doses of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine by the end of March. It would be through the global vaccine sharing initiative called COVAX. That is, however, if it's approved by Health Canada. It would be over and above Ottawa's existing agreement with the drug maker. Since there is potential for production delays, COVAX is giving countries a range of potential deliveries. Canada was told it was getting between 1.9 and 3.2 million doses by the end of June, and up to 1.1 million of those arriving before the end of next month. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says a new factory in Montreal, which will produce a Canadian-made COVID-19 vaccine, will boost our country's ability to fight the virus and its mutations. He says the deal with Novavax in Montreal is important, so we don't rely on foreign imports in future pandemics. Obviously, uh, we know that standing up domestic production capacity uh, is the right thing to do. We need to uh, restore our capacity in our pharmaceutical industry in Canada to uh, supply vaccines to Canadians, whether it's for uh, further waves of uh, this virus or it's for future viruses. Uh, Canada has made a commitment uh, to ensure that we have both the scientific and the production uh, capacity uh, to meet uh, the needs of Canadians. Canadians, regardless of what the future is. So that's part of what we're doing and why we're so pleased to be moving forward with Novavax. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says the Liberals' announcement of a tentative deal with Novavax to manufacture a COVID-19 vaccine in Canada is a good development, but it should have come a lot sooner. Conservatives want to see the Liberal government succeed in securing all of these tools for Canadians, especially vaccines. We welcome the news that Canada will finally be moving towards a plan to make vaccines domestically, something we called for months ago. But why did the Liberal government take so long to act? Why did they first choose to partner with China? How does today's announcement help us now? This underscores there has never been a, a plan with this government to manufacture and secure capacity for vaccines here. We were late on rapid tests, late on vaccines, and each week the news gets worse in terms of Canada not receiving access from overseas and not having the capacity. We need vaccines to turn the corner on COVID-19. Political reporter Brian Lilly says the rollout of the vaccines across Canada will really determine whether or not we'll be going back to the polls for an election either late this spring or maybe in the summer. If the vaccine rollout from the federal government continues to be problems, uh, problematic, if there continue to be delays in delivery between now and the spring, we will not be seeing an election. If there are lots of shots going into arms and Canadians are feeling good about the vaccine program, then I think the government will find a way to make sure that it falls, to go to the polls, even if it's just going to the next governor general, whoever that may be, and, and asking for a dissolution of Parliament. We'll hear more from Mr. Lilly, one of our regular contributors, coming up after business news. Alberta has 57 cases of the variant strains of COVID-19 with a daycare and three Calgary school classrooms affected. The province has 50 of the cases originated in the United Kingdom, while seven came from South Africa. Most are from returning travellers, but eight cases have no known link to travel. Four of those have been linked to an outbreak at the daycare. In the Calgary zone, variant forms of the virus spread from returning travellers to children. It was those kids who went to school while infectious. The province announced the new cases of COVID-19 keep coming down. Over the past 24 hours, just 259 new cases have been identified. There are still 539 Albertans in hospital with the novel coronavirus, including 94 in intensive care. Now, sadly, 11 more Albertans have also died from the virus. Across the province, there are 6,599 active cases. Fortunately, 116,820 Albertans have recovered from COVID-19. 
Our province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dean Anshaw, says it has been slow, but more Albertans are being vaccinated against the virus. We have now administered 109,341 doses of vaccine in the province, and almost 19,000 Albertans have now been fully immunized with two doses. I have recently heard some questions about a small number of people who may have inadvertently skipped the line and received the vaccine before they were eligible. This is an issue of public trust, so I think it is important to address it here. Public health officials have determined the prioritization list based on risk and science. Any situation where individuals attempt to access vaccine before they are eligible undermines that trust. A 42-year-old father of six is working with a Frog Lake First Nation northeast of Edmonton to open a manufacturing plant capable of producing ASTM Level 3 medical masks. This will be the first mask manufacturing plant on a Canadian reserve owned and operated by Indigenous people. Jacob Faithful is proud of this new venture. Really excited to bring out a, uh, a new manufacturing plant in Canada, the first of its kind on a First Nations land. Um, this has been a, a long um, process of learning, a steep learning curve, anything from how to import, <laughs> how, to, uh, how to put machines together, put boxes together, uh, the materials, raw materials, everything has been a, a steep learning curve. Uh, we're very excited. We're looking forward to having uh, uh, another source for supply in Alberta and in Canada. We're looking to manufacture 40,000 masks per day. Um, our goal is to have at least 800,000 masks available um, per month for the surrounding communities in and around Frog Lake, First Nation, uh, even around Alberta, wherever it's, it's wherever somebody needs a higher grade mask. Uh, I'm hoping we can be a, another, another source. Faithful says he'll be using his own capital to pay for the manufacturing plant and he's hoping to be up and running by February 22nd. The first shipment of masks will be rolling out by the end of this month. Earlier this week, we brought you the story about Nicole Mathis, who was escorted by police to an isolation facility after returning from Dallas to the Calgary airport. It turns out she had the wrong COVID-19 test. Authorities did not tell her husband, Chris, where she was being taken to, which made him understandably upset. We spoke with the Edmonton couple recently who said this never should have happened and feel that the rights have been violated. This is a violation of rights at this point. This is not... Uh, um, just about trying to pr protect Canadians. This is this is infringing on rights and it's definitely overreach. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot better of ways that they can make Canadians feel better about this it, just by providing answers. Um, yeah. I would, I, Nikki's a strong-minded person. I, I just imagined someone that suffers mental trauma or is not emotionally stable having to go through something like this. The PTSD that it could cause, you know, and the long-term emotional effects is, um, can and probably will cause some Canadians is, uh, is not something that's good. It's not a good thing. We have got that full length interview with the Mathis family and Jeanette Roche discussing their ordeal coming up later in our newscast. School boards across the province are about to receive a second wave of funding from Ottawa's Safe Return to Class initiative. The $125 million will be distributed based on enrollments. The money will be used to cover COVID-19 related costs, including support for special needs students, staffing, online learning, cleaning, and personal protective equipment. As for Lethbridge, School Superintendent Dr. Cheryl Gilmore expressed that the bulk of the money is going towards teaching staff, with the Lethbridge School Division receiving $4.14 million. And that teaching staff, uh, there wasn't a particular grade or level, and, and it was more a program allocation where we were able to ensure that our at-home learning classes that parents had chosen at different grade levels uh, from grades 1 to 12 uh, were of a, of a reasonable size and being able to maintain reasonable sizes in our in-school learning as well. This money allocation is the second half of funding that was announced earlier in September for Alberta schools. The province says due to the COVID-19 pandemic, indoor and outdoor sports are cancelled until at least March the 1st. If more than 450 Albertans remain in hospital with COVID-19, these restrictions will stay a little bit longer. Now, in response, Hockey Alberta has cancelled its season. As Ainsley O'Reilly explains now, Lethbridge Minor Hockey is making adjustments on the fly and doing their best to inform parents and players about what the next steps may look like. Lethbridge Minor Hockey and its elite programs have a three-step return to play plan. 
and it all relies on COVID-19 cases in Alberta declining. Step one begins today. Players can book one-on-one -on -one training sessions. Step two, hoping to hit the ice as a team in March. And step three, competition. Our approach is going to be, okay, this is what the decision was made. We move on from here and we're going to be prepared to move on uh, when we, we do hopefully get to step two. It's been months since players have hit the ice in a game scenario, something that's been a difficult adjustment for elite level players. It's been different for sure, not being able to be with everyone in, in person and being able to give each other those fist pumps and hyping each other up together before practices. But uh, I think our coach has definitely done a really good job keeping us together. Lethbridge Minor Hockey anticipates that 60 to 70 percent of their players will want to return playing. That's about 700 players. However, communities outside of Lethbridge that will not be able to return playing may see their athletes making the trip to Lethbridge to train. We could have kids from Brooks at the elite level come here. People in hockey will drive places to play hockey or practice and and they'll go wherever they, the, the, the need is. Hockey Alberta has nearly 10,000 members, many of which aren't happy about the province's path forward plan. But for now, it's a waiting game. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. The Lethbridge Moon Run is going virtual this year and participants can join in by running 6K, 10K or sign up for a new distance to the Moon Challenge. As Micah Quinn explains now, the run has donated over $290,000 to various charities in Lethbridge since its inception. 2021 marks the 34th anniversary of the Lethbridge Moonlight Run and the run will take place from March 20th to 28th. And uh, obviously last year and this year being virtual, things are looking quite a bit different than a typical year. And while we'd love to do something in person, it's just not, not possible at the moment. So we're, we're still super happy to be putting on something um, that people can participate in in the running world. There's a new run challenge this year called To the Moon and Back, where runners can complete a 38.44 kilometer or 76.88 kilometer run over the nine days which are both 0.01% of the distance to the moon and back respectively. The conversation became what can we, how can we link that back to the Moonlight Run and one of our committee members, Man, uh, Randy Moros, had the idea, well, let's link it to the moon. So it is a very short <laughs> when, when comparing it to the actual distance to the moon, but uh, that's why we have uh, the odd distances. But I think it's, it's kind of cool and we have uh, quite a few people signed up in that already. So it's great to see that people are interested. Pinder says that it's very valuable to get outside and run, especially when we're cooped up inside for most of the day. This pandemic is a stressful situation. So even mentally to get out and do some physical activity, it's a great release of uh, tension and just gives people a chance to get out and, and do something different and take their mind off of you know, the situation that the world is currently in. So I think it's super valuable. Interested runners can go to moonlightrun.com to register for the event. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Opposition to Alberta government's attempt to expand coal mining in the Rocky Mountains is growing. Two more towns have expressed concerns. Turner Valley Town Council approved a letter that asked the province to issue a stop work order on coal exploration and to restore previous protection to the eastern slopes until public consultations are held. The town of Canmore passed a similar motion. At least eight communities are upset about the province's plan to dramatically expand coal mining in the mountains. Our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson notes that the Blood Tribe is now taking the province to court over these coal leases. He says there are so many who are upset about how open pit coal mining could impact the environment and our water supply in Alberta. There's been a pretty significant backlash from this. Corb Lund and Paul Brandt, the country music stars from Alberta, spoke out against this. This led to the cancellation of some of these leases by the UCP, but the majority of them, certainly sort of the geographic majority of them, do still remain. Um, so, as you say, the mayors have spoken out. Kenny was on the radio on, on Wednesday morning talking about this and said people sort of need to respect coal workers and understand the industry. Um, again, like the pandemic, not an issue that I see going away anytime soon here. Tyler Dawson will have more on the controversy surrounding open pit coal mining in the Alberta Rockies coming up on Thursday evening's show. Physicians want the Manitoba government to issue COVID-19 vaccination cards for people who need a record from their doctor so they can board a plane once travel is permitted again. 
The province hasn't decided whether it will provide a card or an online record to people who have been vaccinated. The physician's group, Doctors Manitoba, says it would make sense to provide some sort of record at this point of immunization so that people do not request the documents later. Police say one person is in custody after six people, including five children, were shot to death at a home in Oklahoma. A police spokesperson says authorities do not believe the attack was random, but investigators do not yet have a motive. When they arrived on scene, they encountered a suspect leaving the residence with a gun in his hand. One of our officers shy, fired at that suspect, missing him. The suspect ran off. He was shortly apprehended after a short foot chase. When officers went inside the scene, they discovered four small children had been shot and one adult male. There was another female that was taken to the hospital with another small child. Um, they were both life flighted to a Tulsa hospital where that small child also was pronounced deceased. We don't believe that it's random, but we just don't have details yet of, of the, the why or what happened. SpaceX's second full test flight of its futuristic Starship ended in another fiery crash yesterday. The Starship climbed past the 10-kilometer altitude but could not straighten out for a soft landing and crashed. Fortunately, there were no people inside of the vessel and none near the site of the crash. Samaritan's Purse volunteers in Alabama are helping to remove debris and patch roofs following massive destruction caused by a deadly tornado earlier this week. As we hear in this next report, the help is needed now more than ever. It was awful. It, it was a roaring sound, and, and it's just something you can't hardly describe, really. A lot of wind, and it, it was just terrible. And I said, oh, God, keep me safe. Keep me safe, dear God. Please keep me safe. Because I said, I don't I want to be around for my boys. In Jefferson County, Alabama, beginning of this week, a devastating tornado ripped through the small communities of Fultondale and Centerpoint. Uh, there was loss of life, uh, many injuries. A lot of people here now with nowhere to go and uh, needing help. Samaritan's Purse is here helping homeowners like Elizabeth, tarping roofs, uh, removing water damaged contents from homes, cutting trees, and doing whatever we can to serve these folks in Jesus' name. The Samaritan's Purse volunteers, they've been wonderful. They've been here and they've been a blessing to me. I, I just don't know how to thank them. They, they're all just great. They're just wonderful people. As our volunteers go out to serve, we need your prayers, we need your support as we help these folks in Jesus' name. Amazing to see the work they're doing in Alabama. It's great to see. We return to winter-like conditions today in southwestern Alberta, cold and snowy, but there may be a small reprieve on the way soon. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. Now, this is the time of year you want to ensure you have a very strong battery for your vehicle and perhaps even a solid block heater. Jeanette Rocher is here now with a complete look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, later this week, we're looking at overnight lows below minus 20, but before that, we could possibly be above zero again for a very short time. Yeah, we seem to be in this crazy yo-yo effect this week of pluses, minuses, going back to pluses here on Thursday, and then we're gonna plunge way into the deep, deep minuses over the weekend for sure, especially in our overnight lows. So into tonight, minus 10, the overnight low, it's gonna rise by morning into three degrees, mix of sun and cloud expected for Thursday. Into Friday and Saturday, we're gonna expect some flurries. So Friday, all day Friday, Friday night, Saturday, right through Saturday night, we could expect some flurries, minus 19, the high for Saturday. Look at those lows there for Saturday night, minus 25, definitely plug in the car like you were saying earlier. Minus 18, the high, on Sunday, we could get a chance of flurries Sunday night as well. And then into Monday, minus 17 and minus 13 for Tuesday. What can I say? It looks like winter is definitely back again. Uh, we're, so we're going to be plunging outside of these normal seasonal averages. Uh, zero being the average high, minus 12 the average low. 17 was our high temperature back in 2005. And in 1947, it was minus 37. Sun rose at 8.01 this morning and our sunset will be right at 5.30 p.m. So there you go. Nice uh, longer days of uh, 
daylight for sure, even though it's colder. So on into tomorrow, periods of rain for both Victoria and Vancouver. Victoria is high, a lovely nine degrees, six degrees expected tomorrow in Vancouver. Minus 10, Edmonton could see two centimeters of snow tomorrow. Uh, mix of sun and cloud expected in Calgary, high of one degree. Uh, Calgary got pretty dumped on earlier today as well. That tapered out though, and they shouldn't be seeing any snow tomorrow. Minus 18, the high for Saskatoon, minus 15 in Regina. Uh, Winnipeg could see periods of flurries as well, tapering up around noon. Minus 12 is the expected high in Winnipeg. Now those prairie cities are going to feel more like minus 32 at parts of the day, so expect that with the wind chill. Two degrees the high in Toronto with lots of sunshine, sunny skies also expected in Ottawa. Minus one, minus one also the expected high tomorrow. In Montreal with a mix of sun and cloud, uh, they saw some earlier winter storm effects this week, but they're out of it now. 30% um, chance of flurries tomorrow in Fredericton, high of zero. Halifax and Charlottetown both are gonna be seeing a risk of freezing drizzle, a mix of snow and rain in Halifax, high of three there. Um, seven degrees, the expected high in St. John's, Newfoundland, with 60% chance of showers tomorrow and fog patches. So there you go. That is your forecast. Today's weather is brought to you, rain or shine, by the Gym in the North. Start your New Year's resolution today. The union representing Bell Media says a total of 201 workers are being laid off. Most will be in the Toronto area. A spokesperson for Unifor says around 100 employees are union members and are connected to Toronto television newsrooms, while the non-union staff include administration and sales staff. Union members include field camera operators, but on-air reporters will be exempt. Bell Media's holdings include the CTV television network, specialty TV channels, and radio stations. The founder of Amazon, who built an online bookstore into a shopping and entertainment behemoth, is stepping down as CEO this year. Jeff Bezos said he would leave the role he's had for nearly 30 years to become executive chairman. The 57-year-old multi-billionaire will be replaced in the summer by Andy Jassy, who runs Amazon's cloud computing business. In a blog post, Bezos says he will have more time for side projects, including his space exploration company, Blue Origin, and overseeing the Washington Post, which he owns. Amazon says it is paying nearly $62 million to settle charges that it took tips from its delivery drivers. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission says that for more than two years, Amazon did not pass on tips to drivers, even though it promised shoppers and drivers it would do so. It says Amazon didn't stop taking money until 2019, when the company found out about the FTC's investigation. The commission says the $61.7 million paid to settle the charges will go directly back to the drivers. Sony says its third quarter profit jumped nearly 62% as it got a healthy boost from its mega-hit animation film Demon Slayer. The Tokyo-based entertainment and electronics giant reports a $3.5 billion profit for the October to December period. Sony's video game sector thrived as people were stuck at home during the pandemic. It also got a lift from the popularity of its PlayStation 5 console, which went on sale late last year. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 41 points in the day to finish at 17,916. The Dow was up 36 points to 30,724. The S&P 500 was up three points to 38.30, and the NASDAQ was down two points to 13,611. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 93 cents to 55.69 US per barrel. Natural gas was down six cents to 279 US. Gold was even on the day at 1834.05 US an ounce, and silver was up a cent to 26.90 US an ounce. Wheat is at $300 per metric ton, Barley's at $304, canola's at $700, and corn is at $342 per metric ton. Live cattle were down 50 cents to $115.48. Feeder cattle were down 60 cents to $138.53. And lean hogs were up 83 cents to $72.38. The Canadian dollar was unchanged over the past 24 hours at $78.22 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Canada could receive up to 1.1 million additional doses of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine by the end of March through the global vaccine sharing initiative called COVAX. That is, however, if it's approved by Health Canada. It would be over and above Ottawa's existing agreement with the drug maker. Earlier this week, we brought you the story of an Edmonton couple who were angry. Today, we'll bring you the full interview. Hear the story of Nicole and Chris Mathis, who say their rights were violated when Nicole was picked up by health officials at the Calgary airport and whisked away in a van to an isolation center. 
That interview is coming up shortly with Jeanette Roche. Imagine going on a business trip knowing full well that you'd have to produce a COVID test to return to Canada. So you obey the law and you go and you get your COVID test done. But upon arrival to Canada, you come to find out that you've taken the wrong test. You're then told you have to quarantine for a few days and then you're escorted by police and health officials to an undisclosed location. This is exactly what Nicole Mathis says happened to her when she landed in Calgary last Thursday which was January 28th. Nicole and her husband, Chris, join me now via Zoom from Edmonton. Nicole and Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks for, Thanks for having us. I really appreciate you coming on. So Nicole, why don't you tell us your story about what happened when you traveled to Dallas last week? You went for just a full, like a little four short day business trip, right? Right. Yeah. And before we left and then we called the airport, we were checking up on regulations. We did our due diligence to make sure that we knew exactly what would be expected of us. We had done the pilot program in the past where you can land in Calgary and take a two day uh, a uh, rapid test and quarantine for two days. And so that was the plan. The plan was to get the COVID test before leaving. I did that. I got my PR PCR test and then taking another test two days before flying back to come back home. And so I did that. And I uh, went to the medical center when that doctor came in the room and said, what kind of test do you need? Do you need this test or this test? I was like, I don't know exactly which test does which. I just know that I have to have a test that proves that I am negative for COVID to get on this flight. And keeping in mind that I am just land, I'm just using this test to get on the plane. I didn't know that they were gonna need to see it again when I landed. I knew that I was taking a rapid test again anyway when I land. So um, yeah, so I, I get the test done. I go to the airport. The airline lets me on the plane, says that this is the right, this is, they, they didn't say anything wrong about my test. And then I come home. And again, at this point, nothing had been said unless I was in the air when it was said, but nothing, I think it was like Thursday night and Friday was when Trudeau actually announced publicly that, that there were gonna be some changes. Exactly, so before we go any further, our viewers need to understand that this happened to you, Nicole, prior to Prime Minister Trudeau imposing those latest travel restrictions where everyone has to be required to quarantine. So you right. weren't expecting this at all. No, it wasn't even on my radar. And like I said, we called the airport even the day before I left to go just to make sure that there wasn't gonna be any surprises and that nothing was changed. Otherwise I wouldn't have gone. I would have definitely stayed home because this wasn't on the radar to even have to quarantine for 14 days. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so then I get, I, uh, I, I finally land and I go through the line to, to do the rapid test, which was different. Last time I did the rapid test, the border patrol agents just said, you're good to go, go get your bag. And then we went and did that. But this time the border patrol said, you need to go in this line. So I guess it was the public health services of Canada had set up a little table now Whereas, and where I, we learned this all afterwards, we learned afterwards that AHS had hot, has hired the people to come in and do that pilot program. So that's separate from the public, this was, yeah. public service, health service of Canada. Public <laughs> I'm, I'm learning all of this. Yeah. So I, I land and they were there and they look at my test and they say, actually, you're not qualified for the pilot program because your test isn't the right test. It's just an antigen test. And so we'll have to actually take you to a quarantine facility, which was like, what, what? That's not even, that wasn't even on the radar. That's not even in the We've never protocols. heard of that before. We've never heard of that. The only time we had heard it was like months ago, maybe a year ago. And we were all thinking that that well, was Well, we heard crazy. of it back in October. Uh, CBC News put out a, uh, an article that said, uh, don't believe the disinformation of these COVID quarantine camps. You know, and so um, that was on October 20th that CBC put that out. And so we're, we were still thinking that could never happen. Yeah. You know, right. And who would have think that would happen here? Yeah. yeah. So they land, we landed. And of course, I let him know. And he was irate and oh, wanted yeah. to talk to the health officials and find out like, you can't actually make her do this. Because I had a quarantine plan in place. I was already planning to go home and quarantine for two days. And we could have extended that test. here too. Yeah. So that was that. And so they, they told him on the phone, no, this is actually law, legislated law that um, it's all under the quarantine act that we're allowed to enforce this. And so we were like, well, what are, what, are, what would happen if I just walked out? Like, what are you, how are you going to make me do this? 
And right. that, they, he said, that's up to the police, how they enforce it. So we got on the phone with the police and the Who, police The officer, police were already standing right yeah, there. He was right there. So I gave yeah. the phone to him and well, they said- It was the public health person that said under the quarantine act, they have the right to detain you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then the police officer was, he, they're there on standby, according to Nikki, that he was right there. And I talked yeah. to him. There was two police officers there and there was a few others just around and uh, as well as the border patrol. So there's a ton of- like legal action that yeah, could be taken against me. So I was kind of like uh, really nervous to, to just walk out. So we asked him, what would you do if she just walked out? And he said, well, I'd have to, I'm here just to enforce what I'm told to do. And if that means I have to take her and put her in the back of my police car and escort her to the hotel, or he didn't say hotel at that point, to the facility. Um, Cause they, that's what they're calling it. And that's one of the things that a lot of people are like, why are you calling it a quarantine facility? You're making all this up. You're exaggerating this. Yeah, those are not my words. It's not like a jail cell. Yeah, that's what the federal government is calling this. On my discharge paper, it says discharged from a quarantine facility. They're not calling it a hotel, but they they told like they told us you're going to be going somewhere nearby and you'll have food, all these things. But they didn't say what it was and where it was. So um, I had no really choice but to comply and go with the. The police, they, they escorted me to the van and the health official escorted me to the van. I didn't know necessarily who was driving me or who I'm getting in the van with, but they took me to a nearby facility that at that point I was able to read the sign and it was a, a hotel close by the airport. And so Chris, you were mentioning um, that when you spoke to the officer, they wouldn't give you names. Like you had asked. They didn't give me any information. Any question that I asked, they just deflected. I asked the location that they were going to be taking Nikki, and we can't give you that information. I asked, well, what's the address? I, I can't give you any, any information. Well, who is who are you? And we are here to enforce all the protocols and laws. I can't give you any more information. So everything I would ask, they would just deflect, which that's where my emotions got. I mean, really, you know, up here, because my wife is there by herself being escorted by um, officials at the time, again, we thought that it was AHS, but, but it wasn't it's the federal government. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a scary situation when you're going, you're being forced to go somewhere that you don't know where you're going. Um, and, and had no expectation of this. Yeah, it was never, it would have, it would have defused the entire situation. If they would have said, this is where you're going, you're actually going to this hotel. You're going to be okay there. You're going to have everything you need. You're going to have a follow-up test. And it's as soon as it's negative, miles from the hotel. Yeah, it's, this is the address. You're yeah. going to be able to talk to your family. Every question we asked was just a blanket that they would try to cover up any information. So of course, when you do that, that's going to raise eyebrows and questions. Chris, how did you find out where Nikki was staying? Well, when she got into the van, she, she was talking with me um, as the officer was making her get into this van. And I told her, I said, do not turn your location services off on your phone. Uh, make sure they stay on because again, up until up and until then, by then we still didn't know. She had no clue where that van was taking her. I had no clue where that van was taking her, and so I was able to track her movement a little bit. And what I noticed on the on the map was it was a building that was just bordering the Calgary Airport. Um, so she knew before I knew, uh, you know, where she was. She saw the hotel whenever she pulled up. I didn't talk to Nikki until, I don't know, it was sometime after that into the evening. She had to go through an extensive process checking in. She said um, she had to be escorted to the fourth floor and there was a whole protocol and procedure process that they were taking her through. Up until that point, our family had no idea what was happening. I just knew where I could see on the tracking device where she was. That's when I, later that evening, you know, she told me, she said, well, I'm, I'm almost positive that this is a hotel. She said it's what it appears to be. And so it was the Westin Hotel. Uh, we found out in, in Calgary at the Calgary airport that uh, uh, apparently is that's what it's being used for right now. It's being used for this facility to take Canadians that, uh, that are arriving. So Nick, you didn't recognize it as a hotel when they, what did they usher you in a back door or something? They, they didn't take you through the front door. They took you through a side door where they had had it um, wrapped in white plastic everywhere. And the alarming part too, is once they get there, I mean, it's, it's not set up for just anybody, anyone to check into this place. I mean, it's, it's wrapped with plastic on the front. They've got, uh, you know, uh, medical hallways made up all through. Uh, she, she was escorted to the, to her room, to the fourth floor. There was a, uh, a security, security guard. guard in the hallway that would enforce her to stay there. 
And so, you know, rights are stripped at that point, you know, and which makes no sense that um, she can't just come home and quarantine. What was it like once you were there? Was it almost just like, oh, it's just a normal hotel room? Like, were they able to bring you food or anything? Or what was it like yeah. staying you were there yeah. for two nights, right? Yeah, I was there for two nights and they give you like this piece of paper that has these options to pick what food you want. So you do get three meals a day and they just knock on your door and leave it outside. And so you can pick it up and eat it. And then they had other things like if you want, if you needed laundry done, you could put it in a bag. Um, I wasn't allowed to leave my room and the nurse was not able to come inside, which was either way. She just took my temperature from the door and she, she only came once, comes once a day to check your temperature and make sure that you're still healthy. Right. And, but other than that, it was just a regular hotel room inside the hotel room itself. It was just a normal hotel room. It was more outside in the hallways and the movement of, you know, they had to spray your shoes just to get in the, like they sprayed my shoes down when I was leaving to get inside the elevator. I was going to ask if, if you had to absorb the cost of the hotel when they took you there. No, I didn't. And I was thinking, obviously the government, like we, the people are paying for this, paying for me to be here why not take that money and get a rapid test right there in the airport and make me sit there and wait until the results come in. Yeah. And I was really pushing for my test to get done. Um, the company that they use, they use this company called NUMI and UMI and they actually, they would never called me back the entire time. I was calling every half hour to get an appointment and they wouldn't call me back until the nurse finally said, a lot of the other people have been using the, their app. So you can get on their app and make the appointment through there. And when I did that, the soonest that was available for me to actually take my test was the 31st. I just tried to start, I called the Red Cross. I'm like, hey, whenever they come, please, please, please make sure that they come to my room, even though I'm actually, to scheduled for my test to be Sunday morning. So, because my understanding is once everything happened at the airport, did they not test you there with the proper PCR test? You no. had to actually schedule that? Yeah, I had to pay for it and schedule it. Now I think that they were gonna let me quarantine, but if I wanted to get a test done earlier, I could, I could pay for this test. Which you did. Which is what I did. Yeah. They told her that they would come the following morning and test her. They didn't show up until 4 p 4, 4 30 p.m. the next afternoon. You can pay for a 24 hour turnaround for $220 or something like that. Or you can pay for a 12 hour turnaround for $250. So I paid for the 12 hour one. The extra part that was even more frustrating is they finally gave her a test. And when she got the negative results back, the PCR test, um, they still wouldn't let her leave for another 13 or 14 hours after that. They made her stay there and wait for a nurse to come sign off on all this. There's a lot of other things. I, I mean, I understand whatever. There's a lot of other things that they could have done a lot better to make this way less. But even after all of this, there's been other cases where uh, people have ex been experiencing the same type of stuff. So they're not really trying to probably make it any easier for people. Right. Do you feel like your rights have been violated? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like not being able to make the decision. I feel like if you don't have a good quarantine plan, if you live with elderly or you live with auto, like immune, immunocompromised, something like this might be a good solution for people should they choose to do that. But for me to not even have the choice to go home and quarantine or, or be made to go into this facility, especially when I was doing everything that I knew I was supposed to do to do everything right. I, I admitted I made um, the mistake of getting the wrong test, but I didn't know it was the wrong test until I landed. So there, it's it's not that I'm trying to be a, go against the grain and like fight the system or anything. Yeah, it we're not just... we're not against quarantining. We've done we've quarantined probably this is probably our fourth or fifth time we've done this. Um, you know, at our church that we pastor, we have all the protocols and procedures set up. We really try to work with AHS to keep people safe and healthy, but this is a violation of rights at this point. This is not uh, um, just about trying to pr protect Canadians. This is this is infringing on rights and it's definitely overreach. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot better ways that they can make Canadians feel better about this it, just by providing answers. Um, yeah. I would, I, Nikki's a strong-minded person. I, I just imagined someone that suffers mental trauma or is not emotionally stable having to go through something like this the ptsd that it could cause you know and the long-term emotional effects is um can and probably will cause some canadians is uh is not something that's good it's not a good thing do you have a message for our viewers i do think there needs to be a protection or a line somewhere 
that we the people get to decide what is infringing on our rights and what's not and con contacting our MLAs and our MPs and the people that really can say something and help has is really the only way we can do it. Yeah, and also, I guess, understand the differences between the different types of COVID tests, right? Yeah, yeah. that's a big one. Yeah, I didn't, we didn't know, I've never heard of the difference between the yeah. two. And I'm not saying that it's nowhere on the internet. And, we, and we've owned that part of it. Like, you know, that was a mistake that is ultimately our fault. And I guess just to be clear, it's the antigen test that you took, and that was the wrong one. That's the one that they do not accept at, at the airport. So, I mean, honestly, American Airlines, too, there, there were a number of things that kind of failed, I think, in this process. I really American wish Airlines that. shouldn't have accepted yeah. the door, right? Had she rejected my test, I actually got to the airport early enough to where had she rejected my test, I could have gone, most likely gone back and gotten the right one. Yeah. But she let me on the plane and didn't see that. And I didn't, again, and I didn't even know that they were going to need it again when I landed. And to be clear, it's the PCR test, the, the test the for the... One. Yeah, I think it's the, the antigen test is a test that the U.S. uses and they accept. The PCR is what Canada uses and accepts. So it's it's uh, travelers definitely have to be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Chris and Nicole Mathis, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. The Trudeau Liberals had a big announcement recently when they said that Canada would begin making its own vaccine right here in Canada at a Montreal plant this summer. Political reporter Brian Lilly has more of the details for us. Brian, when the Liberals say summer, what they really mean is what, maybe the end of the year? <laughs> December. I'm not sure when December became part of Canada's summer, but it was an odd announcement. You know, Prime Minister Trudeau came out and announced something I wished he'd announced months ago at the beginning of this pandemic. We will make our own vaccines right here in Canada. Well, he kind of announced that once before when he announced the deal with China that fell apart three days after it was announced, but I digress. Now he's saying we've signed a deal with a company called Novavax and they're gonna come in and take over this plant that we're building and produce their vaccine here in Canada. And he really made it sound like it would be this summer. He said, oh, the plant will be finished this summer. Okay, well, when's vaccine production gonna start? Reporters were asking, he's like, very vague. He was hemming and hawing. He said, well, you should ask the, the ministers up in the next news conference. So guess what reporters did? They asked the ministers. And Min industry minister Francois-Philippe Champagne said, oh yeah, by the end of the year. So we're talking December before vaccine doses start rolling out from this. We're supposed to have everyone who wants a vaccine vaccinated by the end of September. It, the idea that this is somehow going to change things is a non-starter. You know, will it be ready for the next pandemic? Maybe. Will it be ready for something else? Maybe. But this is not going to be the silver bullet that gets us out of the awful COVID life that we've all been living since last March of openings, closings, restrictions, social distancing, and all of that. It's simply not going to happen. Well, let me ask you something. When will Health Canada actually approve the vaccine? Well, that's an unknown as well. So they, they signed this deal with Novavax. It's number five in line. We've approved two out of the seven vaccines that we have signed uh, contracts with their manufacturers, Pfizer and Moderna. And of course, well, we'll probably talk about delivery problems with them at some point. But Novavax just applied to Health Canada to have their vaccine approved for use. Their clinical trials are just wrapping up. So uh, they're in line behind AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. They're not ready. Um, I'm not sure why we didn't secure a contract with AstraZeneca to make it at a plant in Toronto or Quebec City, or there are plants in Montreal. You know, I was speaking with the former CEO of GlaxoSmithKline, a guy named Paul Lucas. Maybe you saw uh, the op-ed that he wrote in Financial Post a while ago. It made the rounds online uh, in a tremendous fashion because he just said, look, this idea that we can't produce vaccines in Canada simply isn't true. We could. And he told me that we would be able to produce one of these other vaccines in Canada. Unfortunately, we're not doing that. And, and, and this new plan that we're doing is going to take almost a full year to come to fruition. Now, Brian, making vaccines right here in Canada, Canadian-made product, is becoming more and more important as we deal with what's being dubbed as vaccine nationalism. Do we need to worry now that the EU may be blocking vaccine exports the way the United States is? 
Absolutely. And I think this is part of why the prime minister came out and made this announcement when he did, uh, because the European Union late last week brought in what they call, they said, it's not an export ban. And if you called it that, they would call up and they'd say, Hal, don't call it a ban. It's not an export ban. It's an export control. What's the difference? Well, they're not necessarily going to stop Canada from getting our doses, but they could at any moment. And that's the problem. I'll, I'll grant the Prime Minister this and uh, International Trade Minister Mary Ng. They immediately called their European counterparts and said, this is a problem. We have placed orders. We're paying for this vaccine. We need to get it. The European leader said, oh, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. This is not going to affect Canada. OK, if it's not going to affect Canada, why aren't we on the list of countries that are exempt from these controls? Instead, we're not. We are on the list of countries that could be impacted. And while the European Union will say nice words, as soon as one of their member states could be Germany, could be France, could be Italy, turns around and says, hey, we're not getting our fair share. Why are you shipping to Canada? Guess what? We are going to be out of luck. There are no written guarantees. There are no uh, conditions. And by the way, yes, we have a free trade deal with the European Union. This is exempt. It was written specifically into the agreement that this very type of thing, which we probably thought would never happen, this is exempt. Now, you've been very critical of the Trudeau government's vaccine program, saying it's leaving us in kind of a bad spot. Where was Canada in vaccinating its population then, and where are we now? Well, two weeks ago, when I really started tracking this, we were at 12th in the world. And I published it at the time. I said, 12th in the world just isn't good enough for Canada. You know, we're supposed to be a leading country. We're a G7 country. Well, by this past weekend, when I wrote a, a column for the Toronto Sun, we were down to 23rd. So we're a G7 country. We're a top 10 economy. And we were 23rd in the world and falling because we got zero Pfizer vaccines last week, zero Moderna vaccines. And this week, as we get both Pfizer and Moderna, Moderna they're cut significantly. Pfizer by more than 80% and Moderna by 22%. So provinces are having a scramble and they simply don't have doses to put into arms. Guess what, Hal? Now we're at 30th and falling. Uh, you know, we could be at 40 soon, the way things are going, because we're simply not getting the doses. We do not have the vaccines. And this threat from the EU that, that's putting us at risk, let me tell you, it is keeping... Um, provincial leaders in charge of the vaccine rollout up at night. So too is the fact, by the way, I should add this, that on Tuesday, the federal government, which runs a website that tells the provinces and the public when we will be getting uh, doses of a certain vaccine, they removed the shipment for Moderna for the week of February 22nd through 28th. There were shipment details down there. Those have since been removed, which is exactly what happened when Pfizer stopped shipping. That has people concerned as well. Now, according to some recent polls on the issue of vaccine rollout, who is really responsible for the shortfall the Canadians are experiencing right now? Are they blaming the Trudeau Liberals? Or maybe we're blaming the provinces? Well, rightly, they're blaming the federal government uh, at a rate of about 55% across the country. And then it depends on where you are. Um, whether it's, you know, up to 60% or more, but very few are blaming the provinces, which is accurate. It's how it should be. The federal government is responsible for buying the vaccine, getting it to the provinces. Once it's inside Canada, then it's up to the provinces. And you'll remember in early January, you and I talked and there were problems with the vaccine rollout. Some of the provinces being slow. Alberta, not one of them, by the way. Alberta, their problem now is they were going so fast, believing that the supply would keep coming, because that's what they were assured, that now they're having to deal with in, in ration doses. That's what Quebec is having to do. Ontario has revamped its program three times. So this is because the federal government is not delivering. And the number of people seeing this as a problem for Justin Trudeau and the Liberals is increasing, which is bad news if your name is Justin Trudeau. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, Brian, says he's ready for an election of one is called. Apparently, they paid off some of their debt from the, the previous elections. Uh, Tory leader Aaron O'Toole says he's also ready. But what about Justin Trudeau? Is he ready? Will an election be called this spring? Well, all of them say that they don't want an election right now. And the only one that most people don't believe is Justin Trudeau. Uh, yeah, so sure, the NDP paid off their debts from the last campaign, but they still don't have a lot of money to run an election. 
uh, the conservatives would like more time to introduce their leader. Uh, the Trudeau liberals, they're hoping that they can follow in the footsteps of governments in New Brunswick, in British Columbia, in Saskatchewan, go to the polls and get a big majority government instead of this minority that they're living in. To a degree, the, the Trudeau liberals have seen a bounce in terms of voter approval of the job they're doing. And we've seen that for political leaders across the country when it comes to how they handle the vaccine. It's a bit like um, in the United States, everyone rallies to the president in time of war. You know, in times of pandemic, Canadians are rallying to their leaders. So he's got a bit of a bounce there, but not necessarily enough to get a majority government at this point. It's, it's touch and go. So here's my analysis. If the vaccine rollout from the federal government continues to be problems, uh, problematic, if there continue to be delays in delivery between now and the spring, we will not be seeing an election. If there are lots of shots going into arms and Canadians are feeling good about the vaccine program, then I think the government will find a way to make sure that it falls, to go to the polls, even if it's just going to the next governor general, whoever that may be, and, and asking for a dissolution of parliament. Because the government is always allowed to do that at any point, and it would be rare for the governor general to say no, except under extenuating circumstances. You know, it's interesting, Brian, is the fact that on paper, the Trudeau Liberals have a minority government, but with the NDP propping them up all the time, do they not have a majority government? Think about it. In many ways, they do. And they've also had the support of the Conservatives during the pandemic because Canadians don't want to see politicians playing political games when it comes to support for people who've been thrown out of work for no fault of their own. They're thrown out of work because of government decree. So, you know, it, it gets frustrating for me because now and again, the Prime Minister will try and blame the opposition and say, well, they don't really want this or they fought this on that. No, the only thing any of the opposition parties have done is tried to make the relief programs that exist for Canadians better. And I say that about all the parties, including the Bloc Québécois. They've all made good, concrete solutions. And if the government had listened to more of them, things might be even better. In many regions of the United States, restrictions are finally being lifted to try and help stimulate the economy there. Now, here in Alberta, beginning February 8th, more restrictions will be lifted, such as allowing six people per table at a restaurant or a cafe, along with one-on-one -on -one training with a fitness instructor. But where you are in central Canada, restrictions are not being lifted to the same degree. Tell me more. Well, Quebec has just started to lift some restrictions. And, and so next week, they will allow people to go into uh, hair salons and museums and schools will be open. And we'll have schools back open here in Ontario, but we still don't have restaurants open. Uh, we're still under a stay at home order. That may change next week. But, you know, you compare that to the United States, Hal, uh, you know, it's not just Florida that's opening up. Gavin Newsom, the Democratic governor of California, has started to open up his state. He lifted the stay-at-home order. Um, Andrew Cuomo, Democrat uh, governor of New York, he said indoor dining can start on February 14th. How's that for pressure, guys? Not only is it Valentine's Day, but nobody's been in a restaurant in months, so getting a table is at an even bigger premium that night. So all these things are happening, but he, across Canada, People are just not comfortable with the idea of opening things back up. A poll done by Campaign Research looked at this, and there are more people who think that there should be increased restrictions Whoa. rather than no restrictions at all. And that includes 43% in Alberta who aren't happy with the fact that the Kenny government is relaxing restrictions, and they'd like to see an increase. So, you know, yeah, this is, this is the way it's going across the country. A lot of people say either things are good with the way they are, keep them, or increase restrictions. And across the country, that tends to be higher than either loosen restrictions or the smallest group, which is get rid of them all right now. So many of the business owners who we've chatted with on Bridge City News are saying, no, you got to lift these restrictions. you got to let us open up or we're going to be going under. That's the bottom line. So many of the small business owners are hurting across the country. Now, speaking of business, let's talk about big business with more pipelines in the news. And these ones threaten the supply of oil and gas in Ontario and Quebec. Brian, will the possible shutdown of Line 5 or Line 3 resonate with people in Ontario and Quebec? Not until they're freezing in their homes and their cars won't run. Uh, this is not resonating in this part of the country yet. And I don't think that it will. 
People in, in central Canada just don't see the connection between oil and gas from Western Canada and the pampered life that they lead, the, the worn home that they have. You know, uh, natural gas, uh, it, it heats about 78% of the homes in Ontario. Uh, there's a large portion in, in Quebec and throughout rural Quebec, it's propane, which was, you know, uh, the, the rail blockades, if you remember that, uh, that only became an issue, uh, you know, a huge issue for a lot of people it, when heating their homes with propane was threatened. So I, I, unfortunately, I don't see this resonating with people yet because they don't make the connection. They still just think pipeline, dirty oil from Alberta, and not everyone. I, you know, I, I want you to understand that there are a lot of people in Eastern Canada that do support Canada's oil and gas industry, but those opposed to it who wanted Keystone shut down, who didn't want Northern Gateway, who fought against Energy East, they won't care about this until they are freezing in their homes and their cars won't run. Ryan, we only have about a minute left here. It's been a couple of weeks since Julie Payette resigned as Governor General. Now you say taxpayers will still be on the hook for paying Ms. Payette for some time to come. Yes, well, she is going to get that pension and it looks like she will still have access to that up to $100,000 a year in expenses. I've also been told that uh, she may not be fully moved out of her home yet. I mean, she hasn't lived at Rideau Hall since she's been governor general. She was staying at a smaller home on the property. It, it, and that may sound you know crazy, but if you haven't been to Rideau Hall, maybe you don't understand how big the grounds are and how many buildings there are. The prime minister lives on the grounds. Several other people do as well. Um, she's still living there. She's moving out. She's going to be getting her pension. And we're going to have to pay for those extra expenses for many years to come. To have a pension like that, we can only dream. Toronto Sun columnist and political reporter Brian Lilly, thanks again for joining me today. Thank you, Hal. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks for watching.